Today on Everyday Physics, let's take a look at the combustion engine, centripetal acceleration plus a mechanical physics lesson on horsepower, torque and speed. So this engine here is a Briggs & Stratton single cylinder four stroke internal combustion engine. We have a piston over here which travels up and down inside a cylinder. The piston is connected to a crankshaft via a connecting rod. The crankshaft is connected to this arm that allows me to rotate it so we can see what happens as the piston travels up and down inside the engine. The exhaust would be connected to this section here. So the exhaust would come out of the engine would flow through the exhaust system. So the air that's going to burn with the fuel enters the engine through the air intake. It then passes along a venturi where fuel is sucked up and mixed with the air before it passes along to enter into the engine. So let's now have a look at the four strokes of the engine. And to make this a bit simpler, let's take the head off the engine. So remove the head of the engine so that we can see the piston and the valves. So now let's have a look at the four strokes of the engine. The first stroke has the piston travelling down. The piston travels down and the intake valve opens, so we draw the air-fuel mixture into the engine. Near the bottom of the stroke, the intake valve now closes. The intake and the exhaust valves are closed. The piston travels up and compresses the air-fuel mixture in the second stroke. At the end of the second stroke, the spark plug fires igniting the air-fuel mixture, which drives the piston down. This is the power stroke. Both the inlet valve and the exhaust valve are closed. At the bottom of the uh, stroke, the exhaust valve starts to open, and we get the final stroke, which is the exhaust stroke, where the air-fuel mixture is expelled out through the exhaust system. And then we're ready for the next uh, intake stroke. The dual fuel engine is also equipped with a backup fuel system. This is a normal diesel process with camshaft operated liquid fuel pumps. The pumps run in parallel with the process and work as a standby. Gas and pilot injection is not in use during liquid fuel operation. <laughs> So we have some, some race cars racing right here, and I have an interesting question to ask you. If we assume that these cars are making this turn right over here, that all of them are making this turn at a constant speed, so a constant speed, constant speed of 100 kilometers per hour, 100 kilometers per hour, my interesting question for you is, are these cars accelerating while they make this turn? So is acceleration happening? Acceleration. And you might say, well, gee, look, my speed was constant. It's not changing. If I looked at the speedometer for the car here, if I looked at the speedometer over here, it won't budge. It just stays at 100 kilometers per hour. I don't have any change in speed over time. And so then you might say that you don't have any acceleration. But then you might be saying, well, why would Sal even make this video? If, you know, and why would that question even be interesting? And your second, your second suspicion would be true, because these cars actually are accelerating. They actually are accelerating despite having a constant speed. And you can pause it and think about that for a second if you want to. But I wanted to point this out to you, because in an example like this, the difference between speed and, and velocity starts to matter. Speed being a scalar quantity, only having a magnitude, and velocity being a vector quantity, being speed with a direction, having a magnitude and a direction. And to think about this, Let's take a top view of this thing, and then I think you'll become, it'll, it'll become a little bit clearer the difference between speed and, the, and velocity and why these things are accelerating. So if I were to take a top view of this racetrack, do my best attempt to draw it. So it might look something like this. This is the top view. I could even draw this red and white 
So red, just to give you the idea. So this is the red, and then there's some white in between. Obviously, I'm not drawing as many dividers as there are in the actual picture, but it gives you an idea of what I'm actually drawing. And then there's some grass out here. So there's some grass over here. And then there's some grass over here. And let's focus on this orange car, this red car right over here. So where you say, and this is a top view, so it's, this is its path right over here. And we're saying it has a constant speed of 100 kilometers per hour. So if you think about its velocity, if you think about its velocity, the magnitude of its velocity is constant. It is 100 kilometers per hour. But what is happening to the direction of the velocity? Remember, velocity is a vector quantity. It has magnitude and direction. So up here, at this one, it's starting to enter the curve. It's going in this direction. And you tend to show vectors by arrows like this. And what you do is the arrow is going in the direction of the velocity in this case. And normally you would draw the, the length of the arrow shows what is the velocity, the magnitude of the velocity, I should say. So its velocity is constant. So the, the length of this arrow will always be constant. But as we see, its direction changes. When it's halfway through the turn, it's not going in that same direction. It is now going in a different direction. And when it comes to the bottom of the turn, it's going in a very different direction. And it'll keep the direction keeps changing as long as it is turning. And I'm not going to go in the math here. We're going to wait for the math on this a little bit later. But remember, acceleration is a change in velocity over time. Acceleration is equal to a change in velocity is equal to a change in velocity over time, or we could say over a change over a change in time. And although the velocity's magnitude is constant here, its direction is changing. It keeps being it, 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 if it had no if there was no acceleration on it, its magnitude and the direction of its velocity would be constant. And the car would just keep going, would just keep going in that direction. So somehow the car is the car's direction is changing inward over and over and over again. And so I, this is just kind of a little bit of a trick question, something for you to think about. We're going we're gonna to discuss the math um, in more detail in future videos. But what's happening here is the, the cars actually are accelerating, and they're actually accelerating inwards. And that's what's changing inwards. And when I say inwards, they're being accelerated towards the center of the curve. They're being accelerated to the center of the curve. And that's what's allowing their direction to actually change. The three factors that determine the type of work a motor can produce are speed, torque, and horsepower. Speed is defined as how fast the motor performs its work. For example, a shaft can rotate slowly or quickly. The typical units of measurement for rotational motor speed are revolutions per minute, or RPM. Work is defined as a force applied over a distance. In the case of flywheels, winches, and motors, the work is called torque. Torque is a special type of work that produces rotation. Torque occurs when a force acts on a radius. Typical units of measurement for torque are pound-foot. The torque illustrated here is equal to one pound-foot. Horsepower is defined as the rate at which work is accomplished. Years ago, before motors were invented, most work was accomplished manually. It was estimated that one horse could accomplish approximately 33,000 pound-foot of work per minute, and thus the term horsepower was born. In modern terms, horsepower is simply another unit of measurement for power and can be translated into watts, BTUs, joules, or any unit of power. Units that measure motor power are typically in horsepower or watts. You can manipulate the connection among speed, torque, and horsepower by understanding how they are related. The work accomplished here, the torque, is represented by the weight moving along the conveyor. If torque remains constant, speed and horsepower are proportional. As the speed, or RPM, increases, horsepower increases to maintain constant torque. 
if speed decreases, horsepower decreases to maintain constant torque. Let's say we wish to keep torque constant but want to increase the production of barrels. If the torque or number of barrels on the conveyor belt remains constant but speed increases, then the horsepower of the motor also increases. In other words, a more powerful motor is required to produce the same amount of torque more quickly. Similarly, the opposite is true. If we wish torque to remain constant and decrease speed, then the horsepower of the motor also decreases. If speed remains constant, then torque and horsepower are proportional. As the torque increases, horsepower also increases to maintain constant speed. As the torque decreases, horsepower also decreases to maintain constant RPM. Let's say we want production to increase, but the speed of the conveyor to remain constant. If torque increases, horsepower also increases to compensate. This means a more powerful motor is needed to produce more torque at the same speed. Similarly, the opposite is true. If we wish speed to remain constant and decrease torque, then horsepower also decreases. If horsepower remains constant, then speed and torque are inversely proportional. As the torque increases, speed decreases to maintain constant horsepower. As torque decreases, speed must increase to maintain constant horsepower. Let's say we want the horsepower of our motor to remain constant, but wish to increase the torque. If torque increases, the speed of the conveyor decreases so that the horsepower required of the motor remains constant. Similarly, the opposite is true. If the torque decreases, the speed of the conveyor increases and the horsepower generated by the motor remains constant. To calculate the amount of horsepower required to move a horizontal load, we must first consider the occurrence of sliding friction. Friction occurs when two materials resist moving against one another. For example, it's much easier to pull a block of metal across a smooth field of ice than it is to pull it across a rocky path. The friction between the block and the rocks is greater than the friction between metal and ice. The amount of friction generated depends primarily on the materials which are in sliding contact. The coefficient of friction, symbolized by the Greek letter mu, is a dimensionless quantity which describes the ratio of the force of the friction between two bodies and the force of them pressing together. This coefficient can be used to help determine the amount of force required to move a load horizontally across a surface. Many manufacturing handbooks contain tables that publish the coefficient of friction for common materials. The amount of force required to slide a load and overcome the surface friction is calculated by multiplying the coefficient of friction by the weight of the load. Once this force is determined, it's easy to calculate the required horsepower to move a horizontal load. First, find the horizontal force required by multiplying the coefficient of friction by the weight. Then, determine the amount of work required by multiplying the force by the distance in feet to be moved. Next, calculate the power by dividing the work by the time in minutes. Then, convert to horsepower by dividing the result by 33,000. Finally, add 5% to compensate for estimated friction losses in the motor or cylinder. Let's try an example. Assume the barrel weighs 100 pounds. The coefficient of friction between the belt and the platform is 0.3 and the barrels move 20 feet in 0.1 minutes. We can determine the horsepower required of the conveyor motor by accomplishing the following calculations.
First, find the horizontal force required by multiplying the coefficient of friction by the force of the weight, which is 100 pounds. In this system, the horizontal force is 30 pounds. Then, determine the amount of work required by multiplying the force by the distance, 20 feet. For this system, the work required is 600 foot-pounds. Next, calculate the power by taking the work and dividing by the time, 0.1 minutes. The power is equal to 6,000 foot-pounds per minute. Then, convert to horsepower by dividing the result by 33,000. This yields a result of 0.18 horsepower. Finally, add 5% to compensate for estimated friction losses in the motor or cylinder. The final result is 0.19 horsepower. With this result, system designers can ensure the right size motor is available to operate the conveyor. If the distance to be traveled isn't on a horizontal surface, the angle of the surface must be taken into account. To determine the total force required, we must add the force required to raise the load to a higher elevation with the force required to overcome the friction. The total force is equal to the weight times sine A plus the weight times the coefficient of friction times cosine A. Once these two forces are combined, we can continue with the same steps used previously to calculate the size of the motor required. First, find the horizontal force required by adding the force required to raise the load to a higher elevation with the force required to overcome the friction. In this system, the horizontal force is 75.98 pounds. Then, determine the amount of work required by multiplying the force by the distance, 20 feet. For this system, the work required is 1,519.6 foot-pounds. Next, calculate the power by taking the work and dividing by the time 0.1 minutes. The power is equal to 15,196 foot-pounds per minute. Then, convert to horsepower by dividing the result by 33,000. This yields a result of 0.46 horsepower. Finally, add 5% to compensate for estimated friction losses in the motor or cylinder. The final result is 0.48 horsepower. With this result, system designers can ensure the right size motor is available to operate the conveyor on an incline. As expected, it takes a stronger motor to move weight up an incline than on a horizontal surface. The relationships among horsepower, speed, RPM, work, power, and force allow technicians and system designers to determine the appropriate characteristics of motors, cylinders, and other fluid system components required to operate any system. We hope you enjoyed this video and for more lessons and videos go to freakphysics.com.